describe yourself as an ambitious person? Is it even right for a Christian to be ambitious? Have a listen to this quote from Thomas Brooks, who was a, a, a Puritan, describing ambition in very negative terms. He said that ambition is a gilded misery, a secret poison, a hidden plague, the engineer of deceit, the mother of hypocrisy, the parent of envy, the original of vices, the moth of holiness, the blinder of hearts, turning medicines into maladies and remedies into diseases. Well, I don't think he would have got very far with Lord Sugar on The Apprentice. Listening to that quote, we might think that ambition is a very bad thing, something Christians should certainly avoid at all costs. But we're going to hear this morning that the New Testament talks about a good source of ambition. The Apostle Paul was clearly an ambitious man, but in a particular way, ambitious for the kingdom of God. He spoke in, um, to, the, to the Corinthians about being driven by the love of Christ. In Romans 15, verse 20, he says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, he says, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim or ambition to please him, that is to please the Lord Jesus. There is clearly a bad source of ambition that Thomas Brooks was referring to where our, our ambitions, our goals become self-centred and worldly. We're warned against that in James 3, verse 16, where he says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every kind of vile practice. But ambition is a good thing as long as it's focused on the right thing. As someone once said, if you're going to spend your life climbing the ladder, then make sure it's propped up against the right wall. Have you ever had that experience of, of climbing a ladder metaphorically and finding it didn't end in a good place? So many people climb the ladder of worldly success, monetary gain, career progression, only to find the top of that ladder it is empty, it's broken promises, unfulfilled dreams. But for those of us who aim to make it our ambition to please the Lord, for those of us who are driven by love and are ambitious for the gospel of the Lord Jesus, we'll find that our labour is never in vain, but purposeful, rewarding and eternally significant. So this whole idea of godly ambition is in view as we look at this short passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 this morning. Paul is continuing to instruct the believers in Thessalonica. And here in verses 9 to 12, he calls us to be ambitious for two particular things, two related things. First, verse 9, to love one another. And then secondly, a particular application of what it means to love one another in verse 10, to, to aspire to live quietly. Or uh, I think the NIV puts it, to make it your ambition to live a quiet life. Now that's an intriguing phrase, isn't it? Make it your ambition to live a quiet life. What does that mean? We'll need to unpack that a bit later. But first, let's consider that first aspect of godly ambition to love one another more and more this is verses 9 to 10 love one another more and more let me read those verses again 9 and 10 
Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So here's a great aim in life, a great ambition for us all to love one another more and more. To be less concerned about having ambition in terms of increasing our bank balances or setting our hearts climbing the ladder of career or even having the ambition of building a large happy family or comfortable home or healthy body. Now none of those things are bad, they're good things. They're just not the best things, they're not the ultimate things to aspire to, to work towards. Here in this, these verses we have the great thing to aim at, to be ambitious for, to be growing in love for everyone and especially believers in Christ. Now notice the zeal for growing in love that Paul encourages us here. He tells the Thessalonians that they're already loving each other in a very striking way. Verse 10, he tells us that, that these believers are loving all the other Christians literally throughout the whole of that area, the whole of Macedonia, which is a large area. They weren't just loving believers in their local church, but they had a loving concern for Christians throughout that whole region. Presumably that meant they were praying for other believers. They were showing concern. Maybe they were reaching out with financial help. Let's just think a moment for, about ourselves. The call here is, is, is to be more than just loving people we naturally get on with people we naturally click with, people of our own age or temperament. It means showing love for people we, we maybe find a bit awkward or, or we don't naturally get on with. It means praying for each other. It means encouraging each other, meeting each other's needs in practical ways where we're able, whoever that person is. And it means loving believers who are further away. Maybe believers uh, in the parish church in the village or the Baptist church, but, but beyond there, having concern for churches all over the country and all over the world. These Thessalonian believers were ticking all of those boxes. And Paul is thrilled by the love that they're showing to other believers. Back in chapter 1, 2 and 3, he thanks God for their love that they're showing in practical ways. Chapter 3, verse 6, he's so pleased to hear the good report from Timothy of their, their love for each other. And here in verse 9 of chapter 4, he says, the fact they have no need for anyone to write to them about loving each other because God himself has taught them directly through his spirit to love one another. So here's a good question. If they've got no need for anyone to write to them about brotherly love, why is Paul writing to them about brotherly love? And the answer is, and this is striking, that although they're doing so well already, Paul is ambitious that they should go further that they should grow still more in love. In other words, Paul doesn't want them just to be complacent and to rest on their laurels. He urges them, verse 10, to do this more and more. And back in chapter three, verse 12, he prays the same, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. I think this sense of ambition, this sense of zeal is so striking and challenging. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not the most naturally ambitious or driven person. I'm not one for expending unnecessary energy. So practically that means if I feel like I've, I've grown enough or if I've progressed enough, if I've done enough work on something, then I'll just happily ease off the pedal a bit, go into cruise control, take life a bit easy. Now that's okay for some things, but Paul is showing us that it's not okay in the Christian life and specifically not okay when it comes to loving other believers. We simply don't ever get to retirement, as it were, in the Christian life or in loving others. No matter how well we've grown and are loving others, there's always to be this drive, this energy, this incentive, motivation to keep making progress, to keep growing, to do so more and more. So let's ask ourselves, do we have this sense of drive in us, this ambition in our hearts to love one another more and more? Maybe uh, you feel tired, weary of loving others. Maybe our energies and ambitions have been more on other things, more worldly things. Well, let's be clear this morning that there's nothing more important than this. There's no greater ambition that we could have, nothing more precious and important in God's sight than that we love and we grow in love more and more, especially for believers. Think about the parable Jesus told in Matthew 25 of the sheep and the goats that I think brings this into sharp perspective. This is the time when Jesus returns as judge. And in the parable, he speaks of how he will separate out the peoples. He'll gather the nations and then he'll separate people into two groups, the sheep and the goats, as a shepherd separates sheep and goats in those days. And he speaks of how the sheep will inherit the eternal kingdom of God with all its riches and glory. But the goats will be cursed and destroyed in eternal fire. And the parable shows us the very simple test that Jesus uses to see which are which, which are the sheep, which are the goats. What is our eternal destiny based upon? And it's one simple thing, Jesus says in this parable, one difference alone. And that difference is nothing to do with our bank balances, nothing to do with our physical health or beauty, nothing to do with our status in society, our home or our garden or our family. It's simply this, have we loved the Lord Jesus? And have we shown that we love the Lord Jesus by loving his brothers? In other words, have we loved Christian believers? The sheep, Jesus says, have fed the hungry brothers, given water to thirsty brothers, welcomed estranged brothers, clothed naked brothers, visited sick brothers and visited brothers in prison. Whereas the goats have, have overlooked the needs of hurting needy believers. And that's the difference. And that's the only difference, Jesus says. That's the only thing that matters when Jesus returns to judge the world. And so let us make it our ambition to love one another more and more. This isn't about gritting our teeth and trying harder. We all know that feeling of being empty, having poured out love to others and just feeling like we've got nothing more to give. This isn't about gritting our teeth and trying harder in that sense. 
but about looking to God, who has loved us with a perfect love. And as we look to him, continues to pour out that love into our hearts so that we can both love God and others. This is about simply asking for his strength, his love to love one another more and more. Secondly, here's the second ambition. Let's aspire to live quietly, verses 11 to 12. Aspire to live quietly. Let me read those verses again. To aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. What does Paul mean? And we need to think carefully about this. What does he mean by living quietly? We could easily think he means, uh, well, to live a nice, comfortable, easy, carefree sort of existence, to keep our head down, not, not to um, be provocative or, or unnecessarily uh, problematic and cause problems for ourselves. Live a quiet life, mind your own affairs. Uh, and maybe some Christians seek to live this sort of life where we don't exhaust ourselves, where we don't make ourselves feel under pressure by getting things done, or we want to just maintain a, a calm, unruffled spiritual poise. Is that what Paul means by aspiring to live quietly? Well, he's just spoken in the verses we've just thought about with love about pushing yourself, about not being complacent, but seeking to grow in love. And we all know that loving people is difficult. Loving people is sacrificial, it's not comfortable. If you think about Paul's whole life, and what he urges on us in his letters is to exert ourselves for the Lord Jesus, for his people, for the kingdom, for the lost. We're not to live quietly in that sense. Even in this same verse, verse 11, Paul talks about working with your hands, which uh, back then meant uh, only really slaves were thought to be able to work with their hands in this sort of manual degrading manner. This, was, this is hard graft Paul talks about. So what does he mean by living a quiet life? Well, we need to understand a little bit about the, the Thessalonian church here. In both letters that Paul writes to the Thessalonians in the New Testament, there's a group within the church uh, that were idle. So if you flip on to chapter 5, verse 14 of this letter, Paul urges the church there to admonish the idle. And if you go on into the second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 11, he writes, We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, this wasn't actually a problem with laziness as such. It was more about distraction and laziness. In other words, having got their focus off the main thing, they've got distracted into the wrong things. In both letters, Paul has to teach at some length about the end times. And he has to do this because some misunderstanding has come into the church, at least among some of them, that Christ's return had already happened, or that it was so imminent that uh, they could just sort of 
not do any ordinary work, uh, that, that Jesus' return was so close that they might as well not bother working and living ordinary, an ordinary life. Now, isn't this so true today in the church? I don't mean the whole church, but certainly some elements of the church have got really distracted by, for instance, the same issue, the end times, obsessed with, with the end times, with uh, biblical prophecies about the end and how today's events might be fitting in with that. And they've got distracted from normal Christian living and normal Christian witness and normal work. I've even heard of some giving up work, selling houses, because they think Jesus is going to return within a year, which he may do, but we don't know that. And it would certainly be very unwise to be presumptuous enough to think we know that he would such that we would give up our jobs or sell our house. Now it's into this context that Paul writes that we should all aspire to live a quiet life, to mind our own affairs, to work with our hands. In other words, he's, he's encouraging us to make it our ambition, our aspiration as followers of Christ, if I can put it this way, to live an ordinary life. In other words, a faithful life, a life where we keep the main thing, the main thing, where we don't get caught up with the sensational claims or the spectacular claims of some. And what is the main thing? It's so clear in the New Testament. It's so clear from Paul's life, from Paul's example. The main thing is to love each other. The main thing is to strive for godliness and holiness. The main thing is to reach out with the gospel to, to the lost, with the message of Christ crucified. The main thing is to do ordinary hard work, to live a faithful life, so that we can give to others and not be dependent on others. Notice how Paul links this to love for God's people, verses 9 and 10, and to our witness, verse 12, to unbelievers. Living an ordinary, hard-working, faithful, sacrificial life is part of what it means to love each other. And it means, verse 12, we won't be taking from other people, other brothers, but we're able to contribute, to give, and that's part of what it means to love. We work hard so that we can love and give. And it means, verse 12, that we'll have a good reputation with unbelievers. Our example of love and faithfulness, of sacrifice and hard work, will earn us the respect of outsiders and give us opportunity to speak about the gospel. Now, I think this ambition to live a quiet life speaks to us all, whatever stage of life we're at, whatever temperament we have. I think we're all tempted to distraction. Uh, we're all tempted to ease off the pedal of hard work and sacrifice and love. And so we're all tempted to lose the way, the way of the cross. And so if someone claims something amazing over here, that means we don't have to work quite as hard, we don't have to sacrifice quite as much, we don't have to love quite as much, we easily get distracted. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul likens the Christian life and work to that of a soldier, of an athlete and a farmer. As Christian soldiers, we are all tempted to go AWOL every now and again. As Christian athletes, we're all tempted to stop running the race, just put up our feet for a bit. 
As Christian farmers, we're all tempted to retire and give up the hard work. It's part of our ongoing sinful tendencies that are still powerful within us, that we shy away from self-sacrifice and selfless love. We'd rather live a life of peaceful, detached serenity, more like a Buddhist than a Christian. And so we're all prone to getting distracted in the Christian life. Whether it be through the sensational claims of end time prophets or, or great miracle workers, healers, or whether it be through worldly distractions of selfish ambition or desire uh, to live a quiet, comfortable life. The call here is to keep the main thing, the main thing. To aspire to love one another more and more and to aspire to live quietly. So are you an ambitious person? Some of us are more laid back by temperament. Paul calls us to be more driven by Christ's call to love and work for his kingdom. Others, others of us are more driven by temperament. And Paul calls us to make sure we are driven by the right thing, by the kingdom and its goals and values. So here is a call to be ambitious, but to be ambitious for the right thing. Let's make sure we're climbing the ladder which is propped up against the right wall. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for speaking to us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for calling us again to the narrow path that is hard, that is sacrificial, that few choose to follow, but where you are walking with us and empowering us and filling us with your joy and peace and which leads to eternal glory. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus' example, for Paul's example, for the way they were driven by love for you and for others, the way they poured out their lives in sacrifice. Father, forgive us for the, for the ways we so easily get distracted, for the ways we easily uh, just ease off a bit. But Lord, whether we're young or old or somewhere in between, whether we're at school or working or retired, Lord, the call is the same for all of us. To be loving one another more and more and to be living a quiet life, an ordinary life, a, a hard-working life, a faithful life. So, Lord, please help us all, we pray. Please help us as a church, as a body, to keep the main thing, the main thing. And to work hard for your glory and for your honour. In Jesus' name. Amen.